So hi everyone, uh, tonight we have another CD special TVMR and this time with infectious disease. And for that, we have two incredible guests, Dr. Lila and Dr. Christina. Uh, Dr. Lila, she's an associate professor in the division of IG at Emory University School of Medicine. And thank you so much for coming, Dr. Lila. Thank you, and thank you for having me over. And we have uh, uh, this time with Dr. Lila, Dr. Christina. She's an infectious disease fellow at Emory University School of Medicine. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Dr. Christina. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back with the CP solvers. Mm, amazing. Uh, so before starting the case, I would love if you uh, could talk a little bit why you chose IG as a subspecialty and why you did perform outside of medicine. Why don't you go first, Dr. Christina? Sure. Um, so I was actually very undifferentiated when I went into residency, internal medicine residency, I think, because I liked everything. But when I did my um, HIV clinic rotation, I really fell in love with ID. I think it's an area where you get to really provide care to a lot of patients that, um, you know, are from different backgrounds and really you, you get to sort of share with them and accompany them through the through the process, especially taking care with uh, patients living with HIV. And the research arena of HIV is very interesting as well. I'm interested in translational reach, research. So um, that those were like the perfect match for me. And I really also love the people that are in ID. I think it's like for very special people as well. So those were the reasons. And the, what do you do for fun outside of medicine? What do I do outside of medicine? Yes. Um, well, so now that I'm in Atlanta and the weather is much nicer, I get to sort of ride my back bike around, get to go to like do more outdoorsy things. I used to play, well, soccer in the United States, but fo football for the rest of the world. Uh, but I haven't done, done that for a minute. So um, I'm hoping to get back on, on doing that, at least maybe some pickup games and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, incredible. Uh, what about you, Dr. Lila? So, so my my path was uh, a little different. I I fell in love with with uh, microbiology actually when I was very young, and um, I, I wanted to be a microbiologist. I, I think I asked for my parents to get me a microscope. I got a chemistry set. Made, made, made a kaboom and then that, that was in so the chemistry set, but the microbiology, the microscope did survive. So I did that, um, you know, and, and for a while, you know, if I wanted to go into just the biological science or to go into medicine. And so then I decided to go into medicine. I, I study in Guatemala. And then um, there, you know, you're exposed to infectious disease because it's, you know, it's a, it's a tropical world and, and, and it kind of becomes natural. I saw a lot of HIV AIDS uh, when I trained. My God, I'm getting my age here. It was like the huge epidemic. So there was a lot of AIDS patients and that um, actually um, had very good mentors. What I like is, is the fascinating history and how how diseases rule our, our culture, our, our political world, just like we've seen with, with COVID during the last two years, how everything at the end, end is intertwined and, and you find all these interesting facts. Um, I think the other thing is I'd like to know that we are the old specialty. I mean, we don't see just one part. It's not just the heart. It's just not the blood sugar. It's none of the hormones, but we have to see the whole patient as a whole. And something that I enjoy a lot from ID, and, and I can say this from a lot of my, at least a lot of my colleagues, as well as close friends, is the social justice that we can do and the health equity that we bring to our patients. And that is something that I, you know, I strive to do and, and, and try to help, especially our, our Latino community that is here in the United States. And um, so, so it's a passion. Um, I think it's, it, it brings a lot of my inquisitive mind uh, into it. I, I'm not a, as, as good in basic research as the rising star here to my, my right. Uh, Christina made this remarkable uh, research in progress last Thursday that I'm like, oh, wow. I can't wait to see her at Croy. <laughs> well, she already was at Croy, so <laughs> more at Croy. Croy is the HIV ultimate uh, meeting to go to of, of basic science and translation. So it was like, wow. 
Um, but I do clinical and I'm an educator and um, try to um, just uh, enjoy the ride. And uh, what do you do for fun outside of medicine? Um, I run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do run. We saw yeah, a lot I, of pictures on Twitter, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I do run cations. So I, I like going to do my preferred distance is a half marathon. So 13.1 miles or 21K. Um, gets me enough out there. Uh, I go see places. So I, I, I like that and enjoy that. And my other one is I'm a foodie. So I like good food. I like to cook. I, I like to try food a lot. So um, hoping to experience some of the Atlanta restaurants now that we're in the and you know, in the, I don't know, I don't want to say end of the pandemic, more as the, as the, you know, the, the pause <laughs> before we see the rise again. So, um, yeah. And, uh, if there is a traveler going to Guatemala, which food would you say, like, please taste it? Um, I think one, one thing that, you know, if you go to Guatemala, there is a couple of things that I would say. One is that you have to have fresh tortillas del Kumal. That means that someone is making these tortillas made out of corn, in on top of the of, of, of a, a of a firewood and everything, and he just brings it out, and then you put a little bit of black beans or guacamole, but they have to be fresh, right? Um, so that that's one. And then the other thing I would try is uh, a dish called pepian, which is it's a mole. Um, so it has earth tones. It has a lot of uh, potatoes, carrots, uh, uh, prickly pear. And it's a, it's a sauce made of sesame, uh, chocolate, and um, pumpkin seeds. Wow. Yeah, if you come really over, tasty. you know, if you come over, I'll make it. It doesn't take that long. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we also have with us uh, Gabriel presenting the case. Maybe you can introduce yourself, Gabriel. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Rafa, for for calling me out. Um, so I'm Gabriel, I'm a medical student uh, currently in Lima, Peru. Also as Dr. Lalia, I'm a, a foodie. So Peru is very well known for having a lot of very delicious dishes. I personally love ceviche and papa la huancaina, although Kushal here in the, in the Zoom knows that we can get Russell after ingesting this. <laughs> And um, what I love about medicine is uh, infectious diseases and also dermatology. And actually both of my parents are biologists. So I have uh, very these infectious diseases love since the beginning of my life. Um, yeah, amazing. Maybe we can pass the mic to Marcella. Yeah, I'll pass the mic to Marcella. Hi everyone. So my name is Marcella. I'm a doctor from Brazil. I also love ID. It's like the best ever, right? Um, and I'm really excited to be here. And I know Gabriel always has like amazing cases. So looking forward to see the case. And we also have Andrea. I don't know if you're in a place to introduce yourself, Andrea. Hi. Uh Thank you for introducing me. Uh, I am Andrea. I am a medical student from Lima, Peru, currently uh, doing a research internship at Buffalo, but now in Chicago. Um, uh, I really like to do crafts, especially postcards. Happy to meet you all. Thank you so much for coming, Andrea. Um, so maybe we can share the screen and start the case with Gabrielle. Yes, so for the Alicor one, um, so we don't have the screen yet, uh, but uh, we have- can, can you give me permission, please? Yeah, sure. I'm trying to find you. Uh, otherwise, I can share my screen too. Okay, oh, can you do that? I'm mm -hmm. trying to find Andrea. Yeah, I'm 
Awesome. So we have a 42 year old male uh, that's presented to the ER due to confusion and syncope. So for the HPI, uh, the patient refers that four months ago, he started with cervical adenomegalis and concomitant ulceration of the ural mucosa. Soon after, he developed severe asthenia and submandibular lymphadenomegaly. He refers weight loss of five kilograms in two months and dyspnea during daily activities. He recently developed cough with uh, clearisputum and nausea and vomiting. He has noticed a change in his voice. It has become hoarser. And patient denies any significant medical problems or prior hospitalizations. I'll stop there. Amazing. Uh, what is going on with your, in your mind with this pieces of information, Dr. Krishna? So I'm trying to piece together the timeline. It sounds like this patient, younger, well, or, or middle-aged patient coming in with confusion and syncope. Not yet sure exactly how acute this is, but it sounds like pretty acute in a backdrop of four months of cervical anopathy, weight loss, cough, hoarseness. So obviously I'm thinking, well, constitutional symptoms and then what bucket that puts me in and then more acutely what happened that caused this person to be confused and to have a syncopal episode. Um, and obviously with this history of adenopathy and weight loss, you know, I'm thinking um, that the differential is quite broad at this juncture, but, you know, in the infectious bucket, obviously I'm thinking um, HIV, and I would want to know sort of that piece of things because depending on the immune status of this person, I also, my differential diagnosis changes substantially. Um, obviously, if they're having constitutional symptoms and we haven't heard about night sweats, but perhaps if they've been having weight loss, that's something that I would want to know if they're also having night sweats, so pointing towards like B type of symptoms and then thinking about something like PB non tuberculous mycobacteria, if they're uh, immunosuppressed, endemic fungi. And then, well, this is an ID <laughs> report, so I'm focusing on the ID things. But of course, for anyone who's, you know, uh, thinking about all of the other differentials and in ID, we always think about the, the non-infectious causes as well. I'm thinking, you know, malignancy could be in the picture, of course, with enlarged uh, lymph nodes and weight loss, especially things like lymphoma, that type of thing. Um, and then whenever you think about TB, you should also be thinking about um, endemic fungi, endemic mycosis. So um, I certainly want to know sort of what happened more acutely uh, and this more acute history of their like altered mental status and syncope. But I also want to know many more things as you can imagine from the ID standpoint, we care a lot about where has this person been, where are they from? Um, have they been exposed to any animals, um, any, you know, unusual travel? Have they been in contact with any livestock or other animals that we should be aware about? Um, I want to know if they've had unpasteurized meals, um, all those types of fun questions. Doc Walk, any, any other thoughts? No, Christine, I think you, you cover most of it. I, you know, so definitely we want to know where this person is um, coming from. Um, and it, it does make a, a huge difference, you know, location, location. The other thing is um, if, if there could be a little bit, you know, uh, the timing of the ulceration and, and what do they mean by ulceration? Is it, is it um, something that is in the front of the, of the palate or is it in the back? And then um, I don't remember hearing if there was any fevers or anything else associated with that, you know? Yeah. Our favorite uh, vital sign is the fever. Yeah, <laughs> excellent breakdown, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel, can you please carry on? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, so for the next Ali, what do we have? Uh, so there's no surgical history in the past medical uh, history and no other uh, prior hospitalization or medical problems. 
Uh, he doesn't take any medications uh, for the family history. It's not significant. Uh, for the social history, he was born and raised in Brazil and he refers no recent travel history. And for the health related behaviors packet, uh, he is a smoker since he was 17 years old. Uh, and he has a history of 25 year smoke. Uh, he drinks socially alcohol and he is a farmer uh, working in agriculture. I have a question, which part of Brazil? Brazil is pretty large as it is. And so that, that will change my differential. If it comes from Minas Gerais, or if it comes from, from for example, from uh, Brasilia, then my, my differential will be a little bit different over Manaus, you know? Totally from my yeah. state, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> From your state, Parana. Okay. Gabriel, maybe you can give the uh, physical exam as well to have them. Oh, sure. Uh, so, so Ralph, I have a question maybe for, for the people in the audience. Parana is in the south or the north of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's in the south of Brazil. It's close to Minas Gerais. There's Minas Gerais and then there's Brazil. Sao Paulo okay. here. So a little bit more is um, also it's near Mato Grosso, it's near it's near Paraguay, and it's near the area of the Iwasu um, uh, uh, um, Falls. So exactly. so that's that's important for a couple of reasons because it's going to be, you know, it's more down down of the Amazonians, but still a significant part. So um, um, from there, and so. With that, one of the things that we didn't put and from that region that we know that happens is Leishmania. So mm -hmm. I, I would put that on the differential as a parasitic is Leishmania. Um, and that can give you, I mean, it doesn't give you adenomegalies as so much, but it can give you hepatosplenomegalies. Um, and and if, it's con if it's with HIV, it can be disseminated. Um, and then, um, yeah, that, that would be one of my parts. Uh, Christina? Yeah, I agree with, with adding those. Um, and it sounds like they remind me their work. They, they work as a, like a farmer, right? So it sounds like they have significant exposure to livestock. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, Coxiella, Brucella, although you know, I think these like very specific findings of like lymphadenopathy and these alteration are less consistent, but uh, I would still consider them in the, in the differential if they've been having fevers. Thank you. Um, so for, for the physical exam, uh, we have a temperature of 38 Celsius, a heart rate of 50, per minute, blood pressure of 90 over 80, a respiratory rate of 21 per minute, and saturation of oxygen of 97% on room air. So generally, he's fatigued, malnourished, uh, with decreased state of awareness. And he, he has a pale, dehydrated, and hyperpigmented mucosa conjunctival paler, anterior cervical, submandibular, and submental lymphadenopathy, and an ulcerative lesion affecting the labial and gingival mucosa. Uh, for the cardiovascular exam, uh, it is pericardic with no murmurs or gallops. The pulmonary exam was normal. Uh, the abdominal exam uh, um, he, uh, it was found as severe abdominal pain. Uh, the neuro exam, uh, the patient had uh, altered mental status. And for the extremities and the skin, uh, the patient had pale skin, no edema, and muscle weakness and myalgias. So maybe I can stop there and. I'm trying to make note of everything. So 
Well, uh, looking at the vital signs, obviously something that doesn't make sense is this person is febrile. They're relatively hypotensive, but they are bradycardic, right? So that's, that's unexpected for someone who's febrile. You would expect them to be tachycardic, and especially if they're somewhat hypotensive. Um, and the alteration, I'm sorry if you described it uh, fully, but can you tell me more about the alteration? You were, it was like in the submental area. Can you describe it again? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, so it was an ulcerative lesion affecting the labial and gingival mucosa. So it okay. was in. And no other oral lesions like in the tongue or in the palate or petechiae, anything like that. Um, no, no other oral lesions. Okay. And the abdominal exam was it localizing or it was was it just diffusely tender everywhere? It was diffuse tenderness everywhere. Okay. This person has not had any diarrhea. Is that correct? From what from what you told us in our history? Oh, I'm I'm afraid I don't have that information. Uh, Rafa, do okay. you know? But no, no, there, there was no diarrhea. But it wasn't like part of like a particular thing of their presentation. Okay. And then, can you tell me more about the neurological exam? Besides them being confused, um, anything else in terms of are they hyperreflectic in any way? Do they have clonus, that type of thing, or um, just that they are confused? Um, Rafa, did you know? Yeah, so the patient was confused and uh, thinks of the acuity of the, the situation. Uh, we did not perform a, a neuro, full neuro exam. Got it. And no seizures, right? No seizures. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Struggling to narrow our differential. I mean, obviously this person is sick. Um, again, I'm, I'm sort of noticing this bradycardia that doesn't entirely make sense for someone who appears to be somewhat you know, if, if this person were presenting to me overnight, I would be concerned about them being septic, right? And so, um, you know, they're altered, they're hypotensive, they're febrile, but they're bradycardic. Um, I know that yellow fever can do that, you know, like typhoid fever can do that. But again, I think it's still pretty, pretty broad. I don't know, Dr. Walk, is there anything that's helping you narrow things down? Yeah, actually... Discussion? Yeah, actually a couple of things. I think there's a couple of clues here. So uh, first of all, he's 42, he's a farmer, he's from Perina, and he has cervicoadenopathy with, a, with a, an ulcer that is uh, mostly on labial and gingival, on the hoarseness. So, and then this shortness of breath and this cough that he has. So he has what I call the Brazilian TV probably, which is paracoxidio. So I would put paracoxidio as one of them, um, uh, paracoxidio mycosis brasilensis, especially if they're farmers, um, they, they tend to be more around that region. And you can still have co-commentant uh, um, um, with HIV or AIDS, and that's well described. Um, so it's still an HIV test has to be done. Uh, but barricoxidio can mimic a lot of uh, tuberculosis. It can mimic a lot of histoplasma. So that regional parana has paracoxidio, histo, um, uh, some crypto, but not as much, but histo and paracoxidio are mainly there. And then, you know, you still think of leishmania. The problem with um, leishmania is that here you don't describe a hepatosplenomegaly to think that he had mucosal, um, uh, mucosal, yeah, mucosal one. Yes. But you could have hoarseness if, if you had, for example, they told me that they looked inside the mouth and it, there was some um, abnormal tonsils or anything that would be there. Um, the other thing, usually the lesions from Leishmania in the in areas that are are colder, so like the nose, like the like the, the skin, not so much in, into the mouth, which is a hotter region. So that would go against um, Leishmania. 
the 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 reason of having you know fever and uh, the forget sign i it could be just uh it's not pathognomonic but you could have different things um together you know i mean you know so it all depends if it's an aids patient and then of course it can you know all bets are off um the abdominal pain i don't know if it's if, if you didn't have any diarrhea if the severe abdominal pain is because there is um lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly, you know, um, so, so that's, that's one of the things, um, I mean, you know, you always think um, typhoid fever, but there was not, for example, constipation, because you don't have um, typhoid, you don't have diarrhea, you actually have constipation by the time you see the bradycardia. So I, and I didn't hear that there was any change on the bowel movements in that sense. So, you know, um, but the HIV study will be good because that, that will change the whole diagnosis. The, the whole differential, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So. Um, and, oh, and I have oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask that we didn't really get a, a sexual history. I don't think. Um, so, do we know are they sexually active? Like any other risk factors for sexually transmitted infections? That type of thing. Actually, he's monogamous with his wife, so okay. only protected the sex. And um, you had another question, right? Besides sexual history? No, no, that was that was it. I just wanted to get a oh, sense of what the okay. risk was in terms of sexually transmitted infections. Thank you, Gabriel. Maybe you can move. On. Yeah, I love the discussion so much, and. So for, for the, this aliquot, I will give you some labs and imaging. Uh, for basic labs, we have a uh, hemoglobin of 11 with an um, MCV of 85 and a white blood cell count of 5,600 with e eosinophils being 12%. Mm. The platelets were 150,000 and the glucose was, was 50, uh, the creatinine was two, the BUN was 40, um, the calcium was 10.5, uh, which was mildly elevated. Uh, so for the liver uh, enzymes, the AST and the LT, they were normal. And the arterial blood gas showed a pH of 7.32, a PCO2 of 24, a bicarbonate of 14, and a PO2 of 120. Uh, the next of the electrolytes, uh, so we have a sodium of 123, a potassium of 6.4, a chloride of 97, a lactate of 0.96, and a anion gap of 12. Uh, maybe you want to stop there and give you more information then, or I can give you also the, the urinalysis. The HIV test. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I don't have here an HIV test, but Rafa, did you know? Uh... Yeah, no, no, it's it's negative. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> You're withholding information. <laughs> so, Dr. Lila, what's going on in your mind with this new piece of information? Um, so, so a couple of things. So definitely there is some adrenal insufficiency. And so now that I know HIV is negative, um, hyper eosinophilia or eosinophilia has been described with uh, paracoxidio and it, it affects also the adrenal glands. Does, so that my question, does he have disseminated paracoxidio mycosis? TB does not cause eosinophilia. So that would go against it, you know? Um, Leishmania does not cause uh, eosinophilia either, nor um, causes uh, adrenal insufficiency with that. I am, um, you know, you know, the PCO2, uh, uh, these arterial gases are with oxygen or without oxygen? So I, 
I guess it's without oxygen, okay. Oh, without oxygen, yes. Okay, so so he's so, so he's satting okay, because it's 120 in your peel too, but he does have, um, you know, you can see that the, the um, his bicarb is low. Uh, so the x-ray would tell me, I, I do think the sodium might be down because um, there might be some pathology there, or is an obstructing pathology because there's something going up up, up on the airway. Um, that's my thought. Um, I don't know, Christina, you have anything else? No, I think I agree. I mean, obviously things that are um, jumping out at me is the low sodium, pretty significantly low, right? 123 with that potassium, yeah. I'm definitely thinking adrenal insufficiency and something that's affecting the adrenals. Um, He's also acidotic, which could be, you know, he has a metabolic acidosis, which could be part of it, but the lactate is normal. So, yeah, I think uh, I'm also interested in the chest x-ray, but I think this is more related to like his probably his, his um, metabolic uh, abnormalities. Yeah, amazing breakdown. Uh, please, Gabriel, move on. Yeah, so moving on, uh, the urinalysis on admission was negative for protein, blood, leukocytes, and nitrates. And the urine specific gravity was 1.025. Uh, the spot urine revealed a pH of 5 with no other abnormalities. And the urinary, urinary sodium concentration was 113. Uh, potassium was uh, 55 and chloride 110. The ur urinary anion uh, gap was 58. Um, the AKG showed tall, tented T waves in all leads. Um, it was a uh, CX, a, a chest X ray was also performed that showed bilateral interstitial infiltrate sparing both the apex and the base. And the CD showed a nodule on the left adrenal gland. Do you have this, do you have the chest x-ray or, or no? Oh, I, I don't have the chest x-ray. And, and, and the CT was just no CT of the chest or that was just CT of the abdomen oh. pelvis? Uh, CT of the abdomen and pelvis. And Rafa, did you know if there were a, if there was a chest CT? Oh, no, not that I found on the system, to be honest. I only found okay. the CT of the abdomen, the pelvis, and the chest X-ray, because I feel like people were considering some ideology. <laughs> so, so Dr. Lila, <laughs> you were talking about a journey insufficiency here. Um, do you have like a list of infectious disease causes that could lead to that? Um, yeah, so the adrenal insufficiency before HIV and AIDS, the ultimate was always tuberculosis. That was one. Then you have granulomatous diseases, so mycobacterial diseases other than tuberculosis, histo, coccidio, crypto, uh, paracoccidio, things that are endemic mycosis to the area. Um, those are the predominant ones. Now, once um, HIV came in aboard, um, HIV became the number one reason for adrenal insufficiency associated with uh, other disseminated things. So, um, so, um, so usually we look at it. So it's not so much HIV, but AIDS. So AIDS is what causes you to have adrenal insufficiency. Um, that's now the number one reason for that. So it's things that are disseminated, things that uptake the, 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 um, the adrenal gland. And, um, you know, so it's usually granulomatose disease. Um, so from those are the ones, any other ones that I forgot, um, Christina? No, no, I agree. I think, you know, um, I'm starting to sort of like the, the endemic mycosis in this case, just it, it would bring things together. I mean, obviously TB would do it too, but um, yeah, but but yeah, I agree. Like the the granulomatous diseases are the first ones that sort of come to mind. 
for adrenal deficiency. And does the chest X-ray um, strengthen your position about endemic mycosis? So pericopsidio can look like many things. And so usually when, when you look at a chest rake from, from pericopsidio, sometimes it has cavity, sometimes you can have the interstitial infiltrate. So, I mean, it looks very much um, like a, a TV. So you'll have a cavity, you'll have an infiltrate. That's why when I wanted to look at the, uh, at the chest X-ray. Uh, I'm more of a visual learner, so I, <laughs> it helps me better. Um, understand what's going on. Christina, do you have anything else to add based on this information? No. So thank you. Um, Gabriel, how many other quads do we have? Oh, so we have uh, one more and then we'll okay. be done. So, this aliquot will be very short. Uh, it's the biochemistry test. So the cortisol levels were below the normal range. Uh, the AC, uh, ACTH above the normal range and aldosterone levels below the normal range, reigning above also the normal range. Um, so then the, the next aliquot will reveal the final diagnosis. Uh, I wanted to ask, Maybe uh, what will be your following next steps uh, in, the, in the final etiology and managing this patient? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it sounds like they're not having any respiratory symptoms. I'm, you know, I'm trying to be um, kosher and think about non-invasive non things we can do first, but I feel like we're going to end up getting some form of invasive testing. So if we're able to get, for example, a lymph node biopsy, uh, I think that would be the highest yield. Yeah, we could definitely send a lot of non-invasive right, non things. Like we could send serologies, history and antigen, um, other endemic fungi serologies, but I don't know if that would make us feel like we certainly have the diagnosis 100%, and I think we're not gonna get away without a tissue biopsy or a tissue diagnosis. Yeah, I agree with Christina. So I would either biopsy the skin lesion. So if you don't wanna, you know, I mean, since that's the punch biopsy um, would be the easiest. Um, I still will try to get a sputum. Um, this patient has hoarseness. So um, if we think that it's TB or, or, or endemic like a paracoxidio, when they spirulate, you'll be able to um, recuperate their, you know, you'll see it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a gram stain or gimsa or, or um, uh, silver stain, a GMS. And then if those are things that the punch biopsy and the spinums are, uh, are fast, and then if not, go for one of the lymph nodes um, there. Awesome. Uh, so you know the the tissue is key. So for this aliquot, uh, the fine needle aspiration of the submandibular ganglion uh, was positive for Paracoxidioris brasiliensis, and the patient started with itraconazol for the uh, paracoxide and hydrocortisone and oral fluocortisone, which allowed the stabilization of these clinical conditions with improvement of the adrenal function. So the, uh, the final diagnosis was um, paracoxidioris brasiliensis infection with adrenal insufficiency. Um, so what I learned about uh, paracox paracoxia is that basically uh, we have um, these two forms of manifestation, the juvenile acute and the, uh, the adult chronic. So the uh, younger patients uh, present with this very rapid and progressive course of the disseminated disease, compromising the reticuloendothelial system, the spleen, the, the liver, and also they can present with disseminated lymphadenopathy. And the, this is very important to recognize because carries high morbidity. And I remember that I saw a case of a young patient that presented with diarrhea and fevers, and we didn't know what, what was going on until 
we, we know where the patient was coming from and then we start to think about this, this condition. And uh, in adults, most, uh, mostly this disease pre can present as a pulmonary manifestation or a disseminated one. And besides uh, mucosal manifestations, some other organs that can be compromised are, for example, the skin, the, the, the lymph nodes, and the other is the adrenal glands. And learning of this case, I will not, uh, uh, I will not um, forget about that. That paracoxy indeed can affect the adrenal glands and present with adrenal insufficiency. And uh, I, th I think another good teaching point, Gabriel, is to remember that the gender here is also important because it's yeah. much more common in males than females because estrogen decreases the conversion of the fungus uh, that it's formed. Exactly. Any, uh, any final thoughts? <laughs> any final thoughts, Dr. Lala and Christina? So, so, so things to, to remember is, you know, so um, for us, you know, where the patient is, like Gabriel said, it's very important and know what the part. So when you look at a review of paracoxidio, uh, brastilensin or Lutzi, uh, which is the other form, they usually are going to see it on farmers. And so it's going to be, or in kind of like, kind of rainforest like. Um, you can have here to the question, you can have disseminated disease in, in non-immunocompromised -immuno patients. That, that is um, one reason is that it has to do with uh, malnourishment. And, you know, so that's um, being, um, being severely uh, depleted of proteins actually can actually make you that, but there's a lot of cases. The other clue, for this was the hoarseness. Um, hoarseness, you can have laryngeal paracoxidio, which is part, and the eosinophilia with the adrenal insufficiency would be the ones that would have uh, put it together. The other thing to remember is that in AIDS patients, you, um, and also obviously the ulcer, so paracoxidio is usually pulmonary and um, skin ulceration. So those are the things. Um, in HIV uh, or AIDS, this is very common, and you can have concomitant TB, paracoxidio, and AIDS together with PCP um, too. So, um, so looking at that is completely. The reason he was shortness of breath or dyspnea is probably from the laryngeal part um, more than anything else because you know he his oxygen was 120 but he um, had issues with uh, um, entering the, the airway. So there was an airway compromise. And so um, knowing that I would have probably accelerated the part and trying to look into the larynx and to make sure that there was no issue about this mass growing. Um, there's also well-described immunoreconstitution syndromes as you start itraconazole which then can um, um, make the narrowing of the trachea more and then cause, you know, issues, uh, respiratory. So, so it is, um, the faggot sign, I, I don't know. I, I think that's just, you know, um, uh, um, uh, you know, um, it, it's interesting, but I, I, I no longer think of as patognomonic part or anything, you know. And the other thing is paracoxidio now has been described in Central America and it goes all the way to Salvador and Guatemala where you see more Lutzi uh, part than the Brasilensis. Well, incredible, Dr. Lila. Thank you so much for sharing so much for us, with us. Dr. Christina, uh, any final thoughts? I oh, just thank you for sharing a great case. I think you guys as always walked us through the case in a way that we were able to piece things together. And just to uh, reiterate what Dr. Walk already said, when we ask so much about someone's HIV status, I think, you know, we're always thinking about the host too and their immune system because that changes a lot what, what could be going on. And just keep in mind that your host is also equally important to the microorganism that you're thinking about and the places where they have been. And obviously if, if they had AIDS or any other, you know, like a transplant patient or something like that, it's a person that can have multiple things at the same time. So I wouldn't just, um, and on one single diagnosis, but this one put it together pretty nicely. Thank you for making me flex my, my muscles both of thinking about things outside of the US and 
to think about hyponatremia that I hadn't thought about for a long time. <laughs> Trying to, to remember my uh, my great teachings from residency, which I had some some great nephrology professors. So. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Christian and Dr. Lila. Um, we really truly loved this session and you, you both that you taught, taught us so much. So thank you. Uh, so maybe we can finish off with Marcella with the teaching points. Hi everyone, what an amazing case and discussion. Thank you so much. So let's go for some teaching points. Uh, first, we started discussing about adenopathy and weight loss. So in ID, we always try to think about ID causes and non-infectious disease causes. So uh, ID would be HIV, TB, endemic mycosis, and non-infectious, you would think about neoplasia, like a lymphoma that can cause a lot of weight loss. Uh, then we saw the patient had a skin lesion. So I always try to find the timing of this skin lesion. Is it acute? Is it chronic? How does it start? It? So have a good description. And we saw that we need always to evaluate the immune status of the patient because it can change a lot your differential diagnosis, especially after the HIV area. So, and in ID, we always want more information. So does the patient have recent travel and try to, to find a specific location? Because like we saw, uh, Brazil is so big, it can change from the Amazon region to the South, um, try to, to see if the patient had an animal exposure or other type of exposures. Uh, and then for oral ulceration, we, we can have like TB, fungi, uh, HSV or v ZV, uh, malignancy, syphilis, leishmania, and a lot of others. Uh, we saw that cutaneous leishmaniasis, uh, it's not so common, but it's possible to present with some lymphadenopathy, but it always, it's usually affects cold region like the nose. And we also thought about visceral leishmaniasis because it was a disseminated disease. Uh, the patient can present with hepatospinomegaly and more systemic symptoms. Then we saw that the patient had a fagid sign. Uh, it can be caused by brucella, dengue, yellow fever, uh, typhoid fever, tularemia, leptospirosis, uh, key fever, and a lot of others. But we saw that it's not pathogen mnemonic, so it can happen sometimes. Uh, then we got it into the diagnosis of paracoxidiodomycosis, <laughs> the Brazilian TB, and it can it's caused by paracoxidiodes brasiliensis or Lutzi, uh, especially in people coming from rural areas. Uh, it's more common in males because female has a protection from the estrogen and required requires lots of exposure. So usually it's going to happen in a farmer. Uh, it can cause skin lesions, especially in the mouth and throat, like in our patient. And it can cause hepatospinomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and adrenal insufficient that we learned here. Um, and we had a clue by the hyponatremia and also hyperzinophilia. Uh, the X-ray can have uh, cavitations and diffuse infiltration, so you might want to order a CT to have more details. And we saw that we have two different forms, usually the juvenile form, that it's acute or subacute, usually called juvenile because it affects young people. Uh, you have a rapid and progressive course with a disseminated disease and chronic form that it's usually a reactivation uh, with more preeminent signs in the pulmonary or mucosa, laryngeal harnesses and concomitant, and you can have concomitant TB or uh, HIV infection. Uh, it affects the reticular endothelial system and it can disseminate without the classic immunosuppression like HIV. So maybe the patient uh, doesn't have a good nutrition uh, and the treatment is with hydroconazole, especially for mild and moderate disease, and aflatoxin for CV disease. Uh, then this patient had adrenal insufficiency, um, and we saw that before the HIV, the more prevalent cause was TB, but now we have HIV. So uh, the first cause is AIDS uh, plus another, like can be TB. Uh, um, think about granulomatous disease like TB, histo, crypto, and pyrococcal. 
Uh, and Tiago told us like that 95% of patients primary adenine sufficient, usually they have hyperpigmentation, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia is not so common, but it increases the likelihood of the diagnosis being adrenal insufficiency. Uh, and another final pearl is that granulomatous disease, you have the granuloma expressing one alpha hydroxylase and it can cause hypercalcemia like we saw here. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Cristina. Thank you, Dr. Lila. Thank you, everyone who joined us tonight and I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Always a pleasure.